Good afternoon, and welcome to Smithsonian Gardens, Let's Talk Gardens, a weekly webinar series where we share information that we hope makes your brown thumbs turn green. And this is one presentation that I really need help to make my brown thumb turn green. I love orchids, and they don't always necessarily love me. So with us, we have Justin Kondrat, that's going to help us learn more about how to take care of orchids in your home. And he is also going to share some amazingly beautiful pictures with you. Justin is our orchid uh, specialist at our greenhouse. So he has made those just blossom and look beautiful. So I know he's going to be able to help us wonderfully. So as always, if you have questions, please put them in the chat box and we will answer them after the presentation. Our presentation will end at one and we'll answer as many as we can, but you'll also see answers to the chat in our resource page that will be posted in about two weeks. We look forward to see what we're gonna to learn today, but first, Justin has a question for you. Justin would like to know are you currently growing orchids at home? So if you could please look at the suggestions in the poll. So yes, I just got started. I have a greenhouse. That's my dream someday to have a greenhouse. Um, or no, I just want to learn more about it and see where it gets me. So they're voting like crazy right now, Justin, and we'll see what the answers are. I'm going to end it in just a minute. 85% have voted. So I'm going to say I'm going to end it and we're going to see what their answers are. <gasps> Looks like yes, they've been growing them for a while. So they're going to keep you on your toes. I have a feeling, which is great. So there are the results. You can see. Thank you all for responding and helping out uh, Justin. Now I'm going to disappear. And Justin, you're going to take over and tell us a little bit about how did you get started growing orchids? Why, of all those plants out there, did you fall in love with them? And what do you do at work to be able to help maintain the health of our orchids? I'll see you later. Yes, uh, thank you, Cindy, and thank you all for attending this webinar. This is also my first webinar that I've uh, given uh, talking about orchids, so you're kind of my guinea pig, so thank you for attending. Um, so as Cindy was mentioning, um, I'm lucky enough to steward the orchid collection within the Smithsonian Garden Complex. And so I manage uh, over, just over 6,000 plants within four different zones. And so it's definitely a, a wonderful job and a great chance to really get my hands in the dirt um, and soil. And so this talk is gonna be pretty much just about the care in the home. Um, there again, everyone has opinions and um, ideas of how to culture orchids within the home. So there again, what I say may not apply to every home grower or somewhat, or if you're growing in the home environment or even have a greenhouse. Um, orchids there again, I've always been interested in orchids ever since I was little. I always remember going to the big box stores and going to the, the rescue cart, as I would like to call it, the discount bin, and trying to rescue some of the orchids. Um, most I did not succeed, uh, but some I did, and that kind of fueled the fire. And horticulture has always been something that I've always been keen on. And orchids just have a way about them. And um, I was fortunate enough to learn about them at a young age and was mentored and really got into it and found that I could actually go to school for it. And then uh, I was very fortunate too to also intern um, within this collection about eight years ago and I'm back again to help um, cultivate this collection. So let's get started. Okay. So there again for the agenda for this uh, talk. Um, so I'm gonna go over a little bit about the Smithsonian Garden Orchid Collection. And then a quick introduction about orchids, species versus hybrid. And then also what makes an orchid an orchid? And then a quick orchid morphology. So there again, the parts of an orchid plant. So they're a little different from other plants that you may be growing or have seen in your gardens or out in nature. And then also the growing conditions, whether the light, the water, the temperature, then pests, and then also virus. 
And then we'll do a quick synopsis of uh, repotting and how we go about repotting. And then common orchids in the trade that you might come upon or you might actually have growing in your windowsills or in your collections currently. And then a question and answer. And please notice all the photography, it's absolutely stunning. Uh, there again, fortunately, um, with mass digitalization and making our collection items available online, we have a wonderful photographer um, that has been able to capture um, our beautiful collection items that we've been culturing within our collection. And so there again, the Smithsonian Garden Orchid Collection, um, it was started in 1974. Um, and it has grown to over 6,000 accessions. So as you see, I'm standing here holding one of our specimens of a Cygnochi species. And um, notice I have gloves on that is really maintaining, um, not for protocols when it comes to the COVID, but also for keeping our collection items uh, safe um, from various viruses and pathogens. Um, just wonderful. This is a wonderful species. If you could smell it, it smells like banana, an artificial banana, which is kind of like a Laffy Taffy kind of artificial banana uh, flavoring. Um, so these collection items uh, there again have the same prevalence as any of the artifacts within the museum, the Smithsonian Museum complex. They're again the same value as the portraits or an artifact within the Museum of American History and all the other complexes. So there again, each collection item is very special and really makes the collection what it is today. We have collection items that date back um, all the way front to the 70s when the collection was first established. This is one range. This is our warm, our warm growing range. We have uh, actually three other ranges where we culture a collection. There again, I really like to keep things clean. Uh, there again, I believe um, good horticulture is clean horticulture. So there again, keeping plants spaced and groomed. And uh, we'll go a little bit over that of how to you know, maintain your plants in your home environment. But it really is a joy. You can see the mist coming down, which is it's very wonderful every day coming to this. Uh, there again, orchids, why, why orchids? Well, they are so diverse and so fascinating. Um, there again, uh, we are on planet Earth, um, but orchids also um, have been able to grow and thrive in all various ecosystems, all the way from the mountaintops, all the way down to the mangroves and everything in between. They grow on every continent besides Antarctica. We even have over 200 native species to the continents of the United States, which is pretty fascinating. There's more native naturally occurring hybrid or species in Alaska than there are in Hawaii, which is very interesting, I find. There's over between 28 to 30,000 naturally occurring species all throughout the globe, which is really fascinating. And then also uh, Confucius grew orchids in 500 BC. So there again, there's a long history of culturing orchids. There again, hybrids. So the species are naturally occurring, found in uh, natural environments. The hybrids have been there again with mankind and humankind, um, just like agriculture, or breeding of dogs or horses or livestock. Orchids have uh, always captivated um, individuals to make better, to make improvements, whether it's the fragrance or how long they last, how they grow, the size, the shape. So there's always a way for improvement and kind of using there again, horticulture is the perfect balance of art and science. So there again, orchid breeding um, is just a great example of um, hybridization and horticulture. Um, you know, creating combinations with different com compatible orchid species, crossing hybrids with hybrids, species with hybrids. It gets very complicated, but there again, with the work of um, scientists and botanists and horticulturalists, they've kept a long list of these long lineages. So there's long family trees and you can actually trace them all back. Um, there's over 110,000 registered hybrids. So that's a lot of plant material. The first hybrids were actually done in Victorian um, era in England, October, 1856. So there again, I don't know where anybody was in uh, 1856, but that was when the first orchid hybrid was bloomed. And orchids are also named after icons and you'll see several icons um, you'll recognize within some of these slides here. Um, we actually have within the Smithsonian Garden Orchid Collection. Wonder, absolutely wonderful. 
they're again what makes it an orchid an orchid. Um, they're again mostly it's the biological uh, uh, bilateral symmetry. Um, so kind of just like the human face. Um, so uh, one side of the flower mirrors the other side of the flower. Um, there are again floral parts. Um, you know, there again, I don't have too much time to go into the botany of everything, but just some terms and terminology that we, we use is uh, stamens and pistils, so which are the reproductive areas of a flower, are fused together to form a column. Uh, there are three steeples which help protect the innards of the, the flower, the, you know, the main bits of the flower. Those uh, consist of a dorsal and two lateral. And then you have two separate petals um, and one modified petal, which lends itself to a landing pad or a lip. So you can see at this hybrid over here, the orange embers, the lip is where that you can see that intense red color. So if you're an insect, you're going to hone in on that. And that's where you would land and then go into the column, and that's where you would um, come in contact, or the insect would come in contact with the reproductive um, spots within the flower. Um, seeds are normally very, very small. I mean, I'm talking dust-like. Um, um, one seed pod or fruit of the orchid could have millions of seeds that are dispersed. And they, the reason why they're so small is that they have to blow through the wind and land in a particular area. Um, to start growing and they don't contain much uh, en endosperm or food like a, say a nut wood or uh, other larger seeds. So um, it makes orchids very unique. But then also the pollinia, which is pretty much a fancy word for pollen mass. And so pollinia is the plural and you can see the image right there um, of the catacetum species. Um, there again, you can see on my glove there, you can see the two little globules, yellow globules, which are the pollen. So if I was an insect, I would get triggered, I would carry that around on my back, and then theoretically go find another one of this particular species, and there again allowing for cross-pollination. There again, pseudobulbs also, um, so that's a fun word, pseudobulbs, and the pseudobulb meaning, so pseudo meaning like, and then bulbs, so like, a, you know, there again, a vegetative structure within plants, so a pseudobulb, and there again, I find them just as interesting as I do the flowers. And you can see some of the images here, just all the various textures. Um, and this, these are all modifications and evolutionary um, adaptations that orchids have um, been able to achieve to grow in various ecosystems that may be abrasive. So if they have dry, um, dry periods, drought periods, they need to store that water and the nutrients to get them to the next uh, season. So all different areas. So really, really cool. And I just, I love the contrast. And some orchids don't need pseudobulbs that they've evolved to grow in various regions that don't require them to have pseudobulbs. So roots. So uh, roots there can, can also be very fascinating. And so we have really divided them and there's some other, um, you know, different terminology, but most of the orchids um, that we grow in the homes are defined as terrestrial or, um, or um, epiphytic. And so the top photos you see um, in these images are of epiphytes. So they're going to grow on structures such as trees or, um, you know, pretty much in the canopy of the, um, you know, of the forest. Uh, there's also lithophyte, which is growing on rocks uh, surface, but that's those are, there's a few species that do that. Um, and then you have terrestrial, which is growing in the ground. So usually found below the tree canopy, growing in more shaded conditions. And these usually tend to have, as you can see, tiny little root hairs, um, since they need more absorption for uh, nutrients and roots within the area. So it's increasing the surface area. So all these modifications are based on where they're growing and within the ecosystem and what allows them to uh, thrive within that unique um, area. Light, um, so there again, light is also critical for photosynthesis. So some of you might have not heard that since um, high school or college. So that's a process of taking water, nutrients and light and, um, and gas exchange and produce being, for plants to um, make their own food um, to thrive. So there again, we have to consume food. Um, they have to, they make their own food. Um, and so light is also critical. So when you're growing in the home, you know, it's there again, knowing, um, you know, we'll go over this later about what the common types of orchids are. 
um, but light. Um, there again, some of the general general rules of thumbs are, um, you know, it's all through observation. So looking at your plant, your plant will tell you what's going on and what it needs. Um, if it's not blooming or just doesn't look right. Um, so just uh, up through observation. So with light, uh, the bright green leaves indicate a happy, healthy plant. Um, so this plant is going to be blooming. It's going to be happy. If it's dark green, uh, this is a sign that the plant is getting not enough light. Um, so it's they're again compensating by making more chlorophyll um, and it's not able to really reach its full potential and gain um, as much energy as it really needs to thrive. And then yellow, green, or red leaf, which I have right um, as the image right here, indicates the plant is getting way too much light. Um, this is an epidendron hybrid. And you can see it's getting a little stressed out. Um, so it's not really being able to photosynthesize given the, uh, the red pigmentation. And then I just want to say um, no ice, please. Um, one of the things is um, you know, most of the plants that you're growing within your um, collections or even on your windowsills, um, they are from tropical regions um, and they do not like cold freezing water on their roots. Um, just as you and I would not want to take a cold shower every single day or when we take our showers. Um, this collection item, don't worry, I just put it in there for the photo and then I removed it quickly so then I wouldn't um, burn any of the roots. So just no ice, please. Um, it's really just to maintain the orchids. It's uh, more of a, a gimmick just to kind of, you know, get people into orchids and then make it seem a little easier, but it's just as easy to do it the correct way instead of just putting ice cubes on it. So watering. Um, there again, um, you know, there again may vary depending on what plant you're growing, but the, you know, bits and bobs and the uh, steps are pretty much is determining if your orchid needs water. You just bring it to the sink and allow a stream of water to run through it for about 15 minutes. So you're using a, you know, your porous media, so it's going to really go through. And what that's doing is it's giving gas exchange uh, for the roots but it's also allowing any of the nutrients or minerals or condensation to really flush out. So you're getting um, you know, the roots fresh, fresh areas to really sink um, their uh, root tips in. And then also feeding is really important. Many people kind of slack on the feeding um, and it doesn't have to be very complicated. Um, so what I usually recommend is you get a gallon jug and you just get a simple generic 20, 20, 20. If you already have orchid food, that's totally fine. But what you'll do is you'll make a diluted um, rate of that. I usually do about a 10% dilution rate. So it's going to be a light color tinged. And that will be enough to really sustain your orchid um, in the home. And so this will be after you're done doing the, the wet and bringing it to let it flush out. You'll just take about four to six ounces and just pour it in the, the pot, let it drain through for about 10 minutes, and then put it back into the windowsill. And tips there again, water your orchid early in the morning, use lukewarm water, and then avoid getting the flowers wet because that can um, you know, lead to mold and various things growing and the flowers won't last as long. And also you know, set a thing, uh, a reminder on your phone to check your orchid to uh, kind of be a scientist and a botanist for a minute to look and observe your plant. And you can see the image here is of a plant that was, it was growing, it was developing, but it didn't get enough water. So you have this accordion effect in the leaves. Um, so that it's not going to kill the plant, but it's just, it's not a, a really the way the leaf should be. Uh, there again, temperature. Um, so really the general rule of thumb for most of the orchids that you culture in your house is if you're comfortable, the orchid's going to be comfortable. So usually most of the orchids that you cultivate within your house um, is going to be an intermediate zone. So there again, highs of 70 to 80 during the day, and you'll have a lower temperature um, during the night. I mean, if you're near windows there again, that's going to be a little, little cooler, but you'll totally be fine within the intermediate range. Um, some advanced hobbyists or people that are really interested will try to push the limits in their home with a hot area or a cool. Um, if you have a house, you know, different areas within your house that have different temperatures. Cool growers can be pretty cool, uh, cool to grow, but a little difficult. Most people will re uh, reuse or refurbish um, old wine uh, uh, coolers, and they'll make that for their growing um, areas, and they're they're pretty cool. But um, for within the intermediate zone, so most orchids you've heard need a little chilling period for them to bloom. This is true. Um, orchids do benefit from a chill area, a chill. 
meaning that a differential between night and uh, day temperature. So you want cooler nights. And you can simply do this if your orchids are outside, um, you can um, you know, allow them to be outside in the fall when the temperatures are still above freezing. Once they dip below 50, you need, really need to bring your plants inside. But you wanna give them a few weeks of that cold treatment. But you can also, if you place them next to your window in the fall and winter, the change between if you have a drafty window um, or the temperatures will differential enough so that you'll get that change in temperature that you need. Um, there again, pests, common pests. These are just a, a little selection. I apologize, some of the images, the scale and the corners a little, little heebie-jeebie here, but um, some of the common pests, uh, mealybug, scale, thrips, and then aphids. Um, so there again, for most home growers, and we also do this here at the, the gardens, is we physically remove with a peppermint liquid soap and so what that's gonna do is you're just gonna do a, just a, whatever the label says uh, with a mixture. And most of these have um, a section for a pass on plant and plant use. And you'll just uh, either dab them with a cotton swab or a toothbrush to remove the insects or mites. Um, so that's a great way. And it also makes your house smell really nice. And then there's also, you'll do a 10%, uh, 70% of isopropyl alcohol and you'll just dip the insect um, and that will help uh, reduce um, the predation on your plants. And you will notice predation if you're doing the observations. And this is also something you wanna do if you're introducing a new plant into your collection is really to give it a thorough look over. There again, orchid virus. Um, this is something we do take seriously at the Smithsonian Garden Orchid Collection. Um, my advice for home growers, um, if there's, you know, there again, the thing about viruses, it can be pretty tricky. There's two viruses that we test for, ORSV and Cymbidium mosaic. Those two viruses are common in the horticulture trade. Um, they are horticulturally significant because they do detriment to the plant, overall plant's health and vigor. So keeping our collection of them safe, that's something that we prioritize here at the gardens. Um, but within your own collections, um, you know, there again, the images of the leaves here could be the virus showing symptoms, or it could be um, a secondary infection like a bacteria or a fungus. Um, so it's kind of hard, it's, it's hard to tell, but you really will know if you do a test or home, there are tests available that you can purchase. But really the main sign is a color break. So you see the uh, images of the flowers here, and that's a, a a really a, a sign of um, the viruses. And there's over hundreds of viruses that affect orchids, but these are the two that we watch out for. And within your collection, if you see an orchid that may be symptomatic, um, and if it's not something that's dear to you, um, I know all plants can be dear to us, um, but it's could be um, impacting your collection's overall health. So I would go ahead and um, discard that, um, that plant. And there's no cure for orchids at this moment. There again, repotting. Uh, so there again, reasons to repot is, um, you know, there again, you can see is one, one here. Um, this Cymbidium hybrid actually busted the pot. So that would be a reason to repot. Um, and then you also have two here, which is, I call it octopusing. So your orchid is kind of, these are the roots searching for moisture. So this would be time to repot. And then uh, the third one here is that the plant is trying to get away from you, but uh, the plants are a lot slower, so you can catch up to them. And so this is an orchid example of you see the nice fresh roots that are growing over the end of, edge of the pot. So this would be a chance to repot. Then the fourth is um, when the media breaks down, usually after two years or so, and the um, roots get very um, aerobic and there's no oxygen exchange and air exchange, so the roots start to rot. So this would be an example of when you need to repot. Um, tips, um, you know, during signs of new growth and new shoots, so that's when you want them to really be grabbing into the new media. So when they're starting to and that usually happens right after flowering, mostly. And then a reframe directly from repotting, or repotting them into a Swiss cheese pot or a glaze pot. Um, I would definitely recommend either doing a caracotta or a plastic. If you do want a glaze pot, you can do a plastic and then you can put it into the glaze pot. And then containers must have drain holes. So there again, get all your supplies together. So this is um, on our stainless steel bench. And so um, here are the, some of the supplies that I would re recommend. And most of them, if not all of them, you can get at your local supply store. 
Um, there again, Orchid Hobbies, the ho Orchid Hobby has been growing, especially during this um, time of being inside. And so um, there again, number one is terracotta pots. Um, so these are tend to go for plants and um, alliances that tend to like have more aeration or if you're a heavy waterer. So there again, eventually, as you get used to plants, you'll figure out if you're a heavy waterer or if you're, uh, you don't water as much. So this is definitely recommended for someone that has a heavy hand um, that likes to uh, really overwater their plant because you get more aeration uh, with the terracotta. And then you have plastic, which is your general um, plastic that's available. Um, the two that I wanted, the number two is a pot clip, which helps a rhizome clip, which helps stabilize the plant. You want plants to be really packed in tightly. And then I'll go through that when I talk about the repotting process. Four is um, there again, a spade that has a nice aerated or sh um, sharp edge. If you really need to get in there and rip the plants apart, um, which does happen as after specimens get larger. Um, five is just a nice clean scissor that you can trim roots or trim anything that's off or and also to help you get some of the bark off. And then um, six um, is charcoal, which is there again um, used for the to keep the media fresh and also to act as a, um, a buffer to as the bark breaks down um, that holds its shape more. And then we have perlite, um, which also helps um, hold air pockets within the media as the bark um, starts to break down. And the next one there, there again is bark. Um, so just a fir bark um, that we use in our potting. And they come in all various sizes um, that you can use depending on what plants you have. Um, and most of these come, you can buy them pre-mixed and that's totally, excuse me, that's totally fine. Um, and 10 here is our uh, sphagnum moss, which you'll see a lot of the plants that you buy from the um, grocery come in this. Uh, there's, I'm not, there's nothing against growing plants in this. Um, it's a trial and tribulation if you wanna grow with your bark or you wanna grow in this sphagnum moss. The sphagnum moss can get a little difficult to tell um, when it needs water by feeling, um, but people tend to overwater that. So I usually veer towards growing and bark. And then of course, keeping your space clean with a nice uh, broom. And there again, when it comes to repotting, um, there again, gathering all your materials. And so you can see all the steps here. Um, so what you'll do is you're gonna remove all the plants, um, the media around uh, the roots. And don't feel, don't feel you know, bad about hurting the roots. You're gonna be, you know, just really get in there, usually with gloves. And then you go through and then you bring it to the sink and rinse the roots out just to make sure there's anything going on. This is a great time to look at your plant to see if there's anything funky going on to see how healthy the plant plant is because your plant is only as healthy as your roots are. So it all starts with the roots to bring up the nutrients. So here again, it's like the Goldilocks. What is the best pot? Never overpot your orchid. You're going to end up in disaster. I would veer on the side of underpotting. And so what I mean by underpotting is when you place, um, as you see here, um, I've placed the plant in the center of the pot and it's just enough to fit, fill the pot. You don't want it just um, in there and just kind of flopping around. Um, that is too big. It's not like a goldfish. Your plant is not going to grow bigger just because the area is larger. Um, it'll just end up in rotting and decline. So de definitely err on that side. Um, and there again with the mixes, um, what I always recommend, bring it to the center. And you're going to take your two thumbs and you're going to press down. And I want you to really press down. I want to hear granola crunching. So I want to hear that. Don't worry about the roots. Most of the roots are actually going to um, uh, die um, once they're repotted, but the new roots will grow and um, take uh, replace the old roots. So just you know, get them in there. And the way to know that the plant you did it correctly is you're going to grab the plant by its leaves and lift it up. If you're doing a plastic pot and it has a good root system, if you don't, this won't work. If you have a poor root system or you're using a terracotta, so you just lift it up, and then if you're able to hold it, that means you've done it right. So that's preventing it from wobbling so then the roots can really anchor down. There again, some of the common orchids that you'll find, um, you know, that you might recognize are the uh, Phalaenopsis, the moth orchid. This is one of the most common. The Cymbidium, the boat orchid. The Dendrobium, which goes by Dendrobium. And the Cattleya, or the Corsage orchid. Or the Oncidium, which is um, the Dancing Lady orchid. Or the Papiopetalum, which is the Tropical Lady Slipper. 
So the first one we're going to talk about is one of the most common. This is the moth orchid. There again, it's been popular ever since the Victorian era. Most common species are from Indonesia and the Philippines. So most of the hybrids that we grow and cultivate in our homes originate from those uh, wild collected species. It's one of the simplest species to grow at home. And I, I say that with a grain of salt there again, orchids, certain orchids may like your home and may not like your home. Um, so, you know, it's finding the right orchid for you. And, you know, there's an orchid out there for everybody. So don't be discouraged. Uh, light levels are tend to be lower. So if you don't have much light, um, this is a great orchid for you. Placing near an east facing window. And there again, temperatures, if you're comfortable, your orchid will be comfortable. Um, there again, humidity, 50 to 80%. So definitely during the winter months, if you have dry heat, I would definitely recommend getting a humidifier or using a humidi uh, humidity tray, which is just a tray with some pebbles and some water. Um, watering is just moderate so once per week. And you can see this beautiful collection item here. There again, uh, the Phalaenopsis, um, you know, these are some uh, images from one of our horticulturalists here at the gardens growing successfully in their home. And you can see them, they're spiking, um, so they, they had success. And so what they've done here is um, th they're growing in moss, but I would definitely um, recommend that this plant get repotted next time after it's done reblooming. So it looks like the moss is really degraded. Um, and you can see it spiking, and then you can see it flowering um, in the corner. Um, so fertilizing, um, so there again, um, in your summer and spring, that's when you want to be moderate, so one time per week. So if you're watering your plant once a week, I would do that fertilizing trick that I shared a little earlier. And in the winter, you're going to be doing it less, so I would say once a month, but it's important to give your plant food. It needs food and nutrients. Repotting there again is on a rotational basis of um, every two years or if once the media breaks down or if the plant is climbing out of the pot or doing the octopus, as I was mentioning before. There again, the media, two parts, um, medium bark, one part, small bark, one, uh, one part medium perlite and one part medium charcoal. Grooming for this, there again, the little tricks. If the flowers have faded, it's not dead. You didn't do anything wrong. It's just getting its natural cycle. What I would recommend, you can do two ways. You can either, cut the spike all the way down to the where it comes out, or you can go down the inflorescence and count from the base up to little nodes. And those are where the ridge areas you'll see kind of, it looks very plasticky and very rigid and you'll bands and you'll count up to two or three and you'll cut up just above that band. And what that will do is it'll hopefully trigger that bud to actually grow a new inflorescence that has more buds um, and that will lessen the time. It usually takes about an hour, a year to do, do it from the base versus eight to 12 weeks from if you cut it from the top. And there again, uh, the boat orchid, uh, the cymbidium, which is wonderful. This is a beautiful photo of one of the cymbidiums that we had here within our collection. This is a beautiful cascading orchid and I just, it illuminates the room when it's, um, when it's fully in bloom and just, and they last, they're very la uh, last of a very long time from two weeks all the way up to a month. Um, so they last a long time and they're very waxy. Um, the flowers there again, 1.5 um, inches all the way up to 2.5 inches in diameter, um, the flower. So you get a, a really good bang for your buck. Um, they love light. So there again, higher light levels, the better. So this would be near an east facing window or slightly shaded south window. Um, I would recommend definitely bringing this um, genera out under a tree during the summer to get some nice rain, but then also to get some nice sunshine. Uh, temperatures there again, this likes a little cooler. It doesn't need the chilling period to really spike and to bloom. Um, there are warmer varieties that are being cultivated in Florida. Um, so, you know, they're able, they're getting, entering the market. But most of the standard cymbidiums you'll find need a chilling period. And that's night temperatures, um, 50 to 55 uh, to bloom well. We get our, temp our greenhouse down to um, sometimes 45 at night. Um, just to really give them that chill to make sure that they're reaching their full potential. Humidity around 50% are really making sure um, definitely during bud development. And there again, moderation when it comes to watering. Uh, you're going to water heavy during the growth months, uh, spring and summer. 
they're again fertilizing they're heavier feeders so this i would recommend a slow release fertilizer or and they're again watering pretty much every time you water um, during the spring and summer winter i would do lower amounts once a month and the same thing goes for repotting you're going to be on a rotation so a lot of these things are just sick cyclical and you'll be on a rotation and um, there again, you keep one to two pseudo bulbs per growth um, that allows to feed the new growth. And this is a different mix. So there again, two fine bark, two parts, and one part small perlite. And these these uh, formulas will all be online for you to available. And once they're finished flowering, you'll want to cut them down to the base. And there again, dendrobians. Um, a really wonderful um, genera of orchids. There's over a thousand species, uh, so they're going to a lot of types and different forms. Uh, most of them are high level, uh, low, light level lovers. So you want to there again place them similar to um, you know east facing or south or west facing windows. Similar temperatures, intermediate. Uh, moderate humidity levels, and these guys prefer the dry out between waterings, and some require a dormant period, so they, you know, time where it gets a little colder and a dry period, so they really can thrive. Uh, this is another dendrobian species here uh, from Australia, actually, um, pictured here. And there again, fertilizer, it's going to be similar to the routine that I mentioned before and repotting there again on that cycle, two years. And this is a little bit coarser media since most of them are epiphyte fights and need that air. So you'll be using a little bit coarser of the, the growing particles that I mentioned. And there again, once flowers have faded, you'll cut back to the pseudobulb. Cattleya, the corsage orchid, one of my favorite um, orchids. Um, so the corsage orchid from Costa Rica uh, to South America, really known for the flam their flamboyant color and beautiful fragrance, made popular for the corsage in the 1950s, which were worn and adored by many of the, our first ladies. Uh, light levels are high, so this is one if you're not getting enough light, the, it will not bloom sadly. Um, but there are, there are breeding many that are you know, smaller compact varieties that you can grow right on your windowsill. Um, there again, higher temperatures um, your, or intermediate temperatures. Um, so they, they can go a little higher, um, but they'll be comfortable within your home. They're again, similar humidity levels. So if you're comfortable, they'll be comfortable. And this is another one that you're gonna wanna dry out um, between waterings. And then this is another Cattleya uh, Garanthes, which was in our, is in our collection. This one actually dates back in our collection from the 80s, which I think is really, it's older than myself um, and it's still thriving within our collection. Um, there again, fertilizing, it's going to be a moderate feeder, similar to what you're doing with the others. It's not a too much of a heavier feeder. You're just going to want to increase those intervals during the winter and the early summer and growing months. There again, repotting when they grow to the edge or the media breaks down. This is also going to be a coarser uh, media. It needs some really good aeration and grooming. Once the flowers have faded, you'll cut back um, to the leaf. They're again on Sidium, the Dancing Lady. Um, so these uh, come in a variety. You'll see these in a lot of your popular um, stores. Um, they're again from Mexico to Central America, South America, and West Indies, and even Florida. We have native orchids in the country United States. Uh, light is going to be in the higher side, um, but they can deal with some dappled shade. So they're again um, east, west, and south facing windows, similar temperatures to what I've mentioned. Um, humidity levels is going to be a moderate, um, and then watering is going to be about once a week uh, moderate as well. And this is a beautiful specimen. And then um, Oncidium continued um, there again during the fertilizing. It's going to be similar. You're just going to incre increase your um, fertilizing during the spring and summer, and then lower during your winter months, and then repotting, of course, when it breaks down. And then this is gonna be a, a kind of an intermix between um, heavy and um, coarse media, or a, a fine and a coarse media. And there again, with this, you're gonna allow the whole inflorescence to die back and turn brown, and then you can remove. Pathiopetalum, my, 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 my personal favorite uh, for last are the common orchids. So this, it's not carnivorous. So a lot of people think with the pouch, it's carnivorous, but it's actually not. It's part of a pollination syndrome um, where the, the pollinator will go into the pouch, 
call out the outside, go through a little ladder, and then go through the um, various, um, the polynia, and then move, take that polynia to another orchid. So it's all about tri trickery and mimicry with this particular genus. Um, tropical lady slippers, um, they are from South Asia and grow, mo grow in, uh, mostly in, as terrestrials um, in wet, damp forests. Um, lower light levels, so this is going to be with your Phalaenopsis. Um, and your temperatures there again, if you're comfortable, they're going to be comfortable. There are a few cooler growing ones and hot, warmer growing ones, but most of those um, are for, there again, um, would be an intermediate or expert level. Most of the ones that you find common can grow wonderfully on your windowsill. Um, humidity, there again, it's going to be moderate. So if you're comfortable, those, the orchids also will be comfortable. Um, and then watering will be moderate. Um, so there again, increasing your activity when there's active growth. Um, so if you need, see new fans growing out, and the interesting part about these orchids is they don't really have a pseudobulb like you would the other orchids that I've mentioned. They more have um, just a fan structure. So they need a little more moisture when it comes to that. There again, fertilizing. Um, so there again, spring and summer, um, you know, moderate. Um, it's going to be similar to the other groups that I mentioned in repotting. Um, there again, when the media breaks down, that's when you're going to um, want to repot this orchid. And the one thing with this orchid is do not um, overpot. It likes, um, it likes to be underpotted. Um, so definitely go with a smaller pot. And grooming, once it's finished, you're just going to give it a little snip um, all the way down to the fan. And this is a lovely Ferrianum uh, species, uh, Pathiopetalum Ferrianum. I just really adore it. And then for resources. So there again, there are a lot of resources out there when it comes to getting into the hobby or continuing. It's one of those things that you're always going to be learning. You can really never learn everything. Um, you know, you're never really an expert um, as much as you may think you may know a lot, um, but it's the best thing about orchids. Um, so for resources, saying Gardens, there again is always here, um, you know, there again for the greater community. Um, Smithsonian Gardens, you can visit our website. We also have wonderful care sheets and then also through Plant Explorer, um, you can see our online catalog of our images. Uh, so you can actually see what we're growing here um, within our collection. So I definitely would recommend that. And you can see this beautiful um, Cattleya Oprah Winfrey Chadwick um, that we grew. This bloomed wonderful this year, um, had, was absolutely beautiful. Um, so there again, that's one of our icon orchids um, named after the, um, icon Oprah Winfrey. Then I would also recommend, um, you know, generally orchid societies, um, the American Orchid Society is kind of the umbrella, um, and then local orchid societies getting in, involved with them. Um, they are a wealth of knowledge and can really welcome newcomers and to get you into the hobby and just to have fun and to be around sim similar minded individuals. And then also social media. Social media, um, there again, could be a valuable tool when it comes to getting into the hobby, being inspired, um, and just learning more about the hobby. There again, knowledge is key. So there again, there's reference books galore. Um, so I would definitely recommend getting, cracking a few books. And then there's also the interwebs. Um, there again, with forums, um, networking within social media. So I would definitely check that out. And then mini orchids, um, I had to uh, include um, Karen from Finance. So this is um, uh, our little kitty. Um, so she loves helping uh, daddy uh, uh, plant his mini orchid of valerium or terrarium. So there again, um, I kind of, she loves to gnaw on orchids. So I try to kind of keep them contained that she can't get to them. And this allows for a great environment for growing mini orchids. So these are, we talked about the standard orchids. These are micro mini orchids that you can grow in your home too. That'll be another talk, but um, you know, Karen has always helping me. And then the main thing is, you know, you might have failures when it comes to growing orchids, but it really boils down to is just have fun with it. Um, you're going to have many, you might have many failures, but you will have some successes and um, they'll bloom and they'll tell you. And I just, I just recommend, you know, don't be too hard on yourself. Um, 
you're constantly learning. I'm lucky that I'm able to surround myself with beauty and I get to share it with people. And, you know, my plant passion and horticulture, this was taken um, there again within our Cymbidium range, which had thousands of boat orchids flowering, um, which was quite wonderful. Um, there again, I have a beautiful mask with our uh, Pathiopetalum ferianum. So it's one of my uh, favorite species. And then uh, there again, we're leaving some time for questions. I know we're gonna have a, quite a bit of questions, I would assume, um, but here's some images uh, from our, our catalog. Um, and I would applaud you and I look forward to um, taking some of your questions. Um, and please be aware that if we were not able to answer all of them, we will make them available at a later date. And thank you so much. I'm tired. I know, it's a lot of information, people. I'm sorry, but it's fun. It's fun. Yeah, it is fun. It's fun. And they really appreciate all the information that you gave them. Thank you, Justin. It was terrific. And you're right. We have a number of questions, so I'll ask some. But uh, again, it, and it, the web, the video actually will not appear next Wednesday. We have a new, wonderful uh, closed captioning uh, company that is working on our closed captioning to make sure that we get capture everything uh, correctly. So it takes them about two weeks to be able to uh, do the work and return them to me so I can post them. So look for it in about two weeks. But how do, should we grow our orchids under grow lights? Does that help out? Yeah, so this is something I've actually started to experiment at my, at my house. Um, I live in a condo in, in DC um, and I, I don't really have much light. Um, so I have experimented. I, I haven't really had a chance to get it, you know, too much involved with growing under lights. Um, there again, it's one of those things you can never stop learning. So that's something I need to really explore. But there's a wonderful forums. I have bought some general grow lights um, that I found. And it has helped them stay a little greener, a little longer. Um, but I do grow in my little grow cube, as you saw. Um, but um, grow lights, I don't think would hurt. Um, there again, it's all about trying and trying new things. I, I wouldn't, you know, say no to it. Okay, so keep a garden journal and that way you'll know what works out best for you. That's, exactly. that's good advice. Should you, and I have this question, I have those octopus legs or whatever you're calling them uh, for my orchid. Should we stuff all those roots down in the pot when we're repotting? Yeah, so um, I would recommend, um, you know, I, it looks really cool. I find <laughs> it is with the octopus, uh, octopus arms kind of reaching up. Um, but for the plant, I would recommend, you know, there again, I would just, when you bring it to the sink, what you're going to do, that's going to do, it's going to, really soften your roots up. So it's gonna really help the, uh, um, the the wax coating, the cuticle that is surrounding the root. It's gonna help loosen that. So it's gonna be more pliable and then you can gently put it back into the pot and then stuff. Don't, there again, don't worry if you're gonna you know, damage the roots. If you crack the root when you're putting it in, that's just another point where the root can actually um, have a node to actually start more roots. So don't, don't feel if you're going to be too violent, but I would, I would recommend putting them back in the pot. I um, mean, they're just going to do it again. So, you know, will is keep them tamed. I like to keep them tamed. Uh, that just might be my personality, but it, it definitely <laughs> helps um, the orchids stay a little bit more uh, contained and growing. Okay. Good advice. I will try that next time. How about, uh, when do you fertilize? Do you water first? and then fertilize? Do you wait a couple days? What's the proper? Yeah, yeah. so uh, my recommend uh, recommending is um, you're going to water first with just your regular tap water. Um, and so what that's doing is you're, you're making uh, it more available. For, it, you're softening the roots or more penetration. So when you go after with you water it first and then you put the little cup of fertilizer, what that's doing, it's allowing it to be really next to the roots. And so it's through osmosis, it's gonna transfer. So all the root, the water that has been coated the roots, that's gonna imbibe with the fertilizer and then there, therefore transfer into the plant. And so then I would recommend uh, doing it that way. I mean, you're also, you're uh, lessening the amount of fertilizer use as well that would be possibly end up in our waterways or in uh, various ways. So reducing the amount of fertilizer that you're using. Okay, that's so what just I recommend. yeah. That's, so I got it. I yep. think yeah. so. I take the pot to the sink. Yep. I water them really well for like fifteen, 
seconds to yep. 60 seconds, let the water run out the bottom. Yep. Then I have my little pot with fertilizer in it at the right, right. Then I water again with the fertilizer water. Does it run through? Of course. It, it might run through depending on how big the pot is, but if it runs through, and that's why you just leave it to the sink just to drip off a little bit, but then that that's perfect. Uh, okay. That, that works, for, it has worked for me and uh, for many other individuals. So I, I would definitely recommend that. And it's keeping your plant fed. It needs food. <laughs> yeah, I, I did learn that the hard way, I must say. Um, can you soak the plant for 15 minutes instead of running water on it for 15 seconds? Yeah, so that, that's also a valid point too. Um, so um, I, don't, I don't usually do that. I usually do the, the washout method. So there again, you're really getting that air through the plant um, and increasing. It will, of course, get air through the plant if you dip it. Um, but I would you know, definitely recommend bringing it to your sink. But it's all about your preference as well. I don't see... It's not going to suffocate the roots for being in there for 15 minutes. Um, so okay. that's totally fine. And that you can even do your fertilizing solution and dip it in that way. You can have a you know, fertilized dipper. It also depends on how many plants you have as well. Yeah. You, know, yeah. you can bring it to your bathtub or your sink or shower and turn it on a little bit. You can always do that as well. That's also yeah. a great way to clean your plants as well. Okay, that's great. The questions are popping up all over, so I'm watching time. I'm not going to be able to get to all of them. But what we're calling octopus roots are the same thing as air roots, right? Um, they're they're so most of the octopus roots are they're air they're in the air. They're kind of searching for an area to you know to adhere to. So those are mostly dealing with epiphyte orchids. So I would call those are also considered air roots as well because they're they're kind of in the air, right? So right. Right. That's I would yep. just to make sure that people understand yep. the terminology. Um, if somebody has a greenhouse. We're going to move all of our orchids over to their greenhouse. Uh, they've agreed to it. No. <laughs> just show up with a bottle. No, no. Um, <laughs> they have a misting system. They wonder, do they still need to water even with the misting system? Yes. Um, so we have within our collection, you still have to water. Um, you know, the misting system is great. Um, there again, we can't live without our a misting system. They're in keeping for allowing for the air to cool, but then also the proper hydration in the air. Um, you still have to water. So that's getting your nutrient to the roots, but then it's also flushing things out as well. Um, so, you know, you're going to want to water less often. So there again, as you do the transfer, um, just keep there again, keep a journal, keep your notes um, and just, you know, observe, observe, observe all about that. So, OK, that sounds great. You talked about some burning uh, new leaves. So yeah. how easy is that? Should you if you buy one, do you slowly acclim acclimate it to brighter light or how do you gauge that? Yeah. So most of the orchids um, that you find at your box store, um, you know, there again, it's all about uh, trial tribulation. Um, but most of them, you're not going to burn them right off the bat. If it is, if it's intense summer, you know, if you put your hand, and that's also a good way, is if it's noon, high day, you put your um, palm to the the window and you feel it heating up. That's too hot. Um, okay. So I would just slowly, you know, bring it closer to the window if it's a high loving orchid. So a high love, uh, love loving light orchid. Okay. Um, that's what I would do. Okay. Excellent. Should we take our orchids outside for the summertime? I do. I do. Yeah, no, it's a great way for uh, nature to do its thing. Um, I did, would, um, you know, there again, caution slugs love orchids. Um, so there again, being mindful of various tricks and um, things you can do to kind of prevent slugs um, from getting into your orchids. Um, you know, there again, there's different um, ways you can do that. Um, but I would definitely recommend, you know, putting it under a shady tree, shady, shady, shady. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there again, if you bring it outside and put it in full sun, it's going to burn. Um, mm -hmm. So definitely, that's something you really want to, you know, caution. And I would definitely bring it outside in the spring once we've passed, um, you know, there again, if the, leaf, if the leaves are out on the trees, you're going to be pretty safe um, to bring them out. Um, and then in the fall, I would definitely err on uh, once we start getting cooler nights in the 50s, I would bring those babies back inside. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We don't want them to freeze. Yeah. You know, all so, that hard work. Yeah, you're no. the blooms and then, then you have a failure. Yeah. Do you fertilize when the orchids are blooming or do you wait till they're not blooming? You, I mean, I, I tend to just fertilize because uh, once you're in a you know routine, um, if it's going to disturb your routine, <sighs> I would just keep going. You know, Good if, point. Just keep, 
keep the fertilizing train going. Okay, <laughs> so, good point. Yeah, if at, I stop doing something, yes, forget yes. it. And you're at, and you're doing it at such lower levels um, there again with the diluted fertilizer, you're fine. Yeah, that's a good recommendation for almost any type of fertilizer. Don't ever do it at the full strength that they're telling you. Dilute it, dilute it, dilute it. Um, yeah, that that that's great. Uh, how do you keep slugs from in the getting in the plants? I have mine up on a tall shelf. I don't know yeah, about yours. Yeah, so there's different ways you can actually get copper, um, like dry, like um, the wool that you use to scrub dishes. Um, if it's mm -hmm. copper, you can string that. Um, they're going to be careful because have gloves when you're doing it because uh, it can cut your hands. Um, but you can use copper and copper wire. Um, you can also get a pie dish and put a little bit of beer um, and they will actually go in there um, and that will, and there's other, there's other uh, available products that you can do some research on, but those are the two easiest ways um, that I've found. Mm -hmm. But there again, when they, you bring them back inside, make sure you don't have any hitchhikers. Yeah, that's another good reason for taking your plants to the sink and watering, because I get yeah. pill bugs come out of mine all the time. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Is it better to do foliar feeding than drenching? Should we use pellets? Should we do uh, yeah. moisture? What is the trick? Yeah, um, so foliar feeding, um, so there again, um, that is something you can use. It could be a trick. I usually don't do uh, foliar feeding here for our plants. I usually just rely on the absorption through um, the roots, but um, most general fertilizers can be absorbed through the leaves um, at some points. So, I'm totally not against foliar feeds. Um, mm -hmm. you know, it's definitely something that can increase. You know, it's try, you try and try. Yeah. Um, there again, what works for you might not work for me. Uh, there again, I am growing in a you know state of the art facility. But when I grow at home, I I usually just bring it to the sink and use that method. Okay. Now I've gone to buy pots uh, because I know you said we need to have holes drainage for our pots. So if we get a plant that is in a pot that doesn't have drainage there's no tricks do we really have to repot it um so what you can do um so if it if it is um you know if it is a like a terracotta or a glass or whatnot um you really should it really needs um you know it needs holes but if it's planted in a like a different pot um so if you have a plastic pot and then you put it in the glaze pot or you know glass um you know dish that's fine, but it really needs it really to really grow them successfully. You're really going to need, you know, to have drainage holes. You can kind of get with, you know, fill it up and then drain it, you know, but it's just going to end up in a mess. Yeah, um, yeah you know, I would recommend just having grow grow hole or pot, okay. drainage holes in your your pot. And I've seen some beautiful ceramic ones that have holes in it almost looks like swiss cheese yes is that a good kind of pot to use or yeah so those in the home so in the home okay. you've got to figure it's a pretty dry environment so um even with those i kind of err on the side of you might want to just use it as a decorative pot and then have your plastic pot inside of it um, okay and but there again it's all about how much you want to mist your orchid okay um, <laughs> you know i mean it all depends on to what how much you want to invest in your orchid um but there again mm -hmm. You want to look at if you accidentally forget a leak or you forget something or if sometimes you forget, you know, the water your plant, it's not going to be so detrimental that you're going to lose all the progress and investment that you put in your plant. So okay. I would just, you know, go towards the safe side and, you know, have it be just a decorative pot. Okay. Here's two botany questions for you. One, um, if you're in a home situation and you don't have any pollinators flying around. Are we worried about those orchids not being pollinated or? Yeah, um, so with orchids, it's similar to any other plant. Um, you know, there again, um, you know, we're not, there's nothing that really will be detrimental to the plant if it doesn't get pollinated. Okay. Um, you know, it's not gonna affect it in any way. Um, if it does, if it did get pollinated, it's just taking more energy from the plant. So, um, I mean, I'd actually recommend it. I would actually cut the the um, the fruit off if it starts to form, just to really keep the energy focused on growing new new shoots and then new blooms. Okay. Yep. Only vanilla bean is the yep. other one. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. There is a complex symbiotic association of orchids and species specific mycorrhizal fungi. Yes. Uh, but you don't seem to use fungi with the horticulture orchids. Uh, do you know if horticulturists are using mycorrhizal fungi to promote to promote orchid growth? Yeah, so this is a great question. This is a, we have a wonderful um, scientist uh, at uh, CERX, the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center that focuses on mycorrhizal fungi associations with orchids. Um, so I have actually been working with her um, to kind of figure out this conundrum. I've, uh, there's several growers and hybridizers that have been working with this in the Netherlands. Um, so there again, there is research happening on this topic. Um, as of now, I don't know necessarily if there have been any um, benefits. Um, they're again isolating what particular family of mycorrhizal fungi that can be possibly beneficial. Mm -hmm. um, that needs research done, but I I wouldn't put it past. I I think it would be beneficial for okay. possible tropical orchid species because all native orchids within growing ranges have this mycorrhizal fungi association. Yes, and right. thanks for bringing that. That's a great great point. Okay. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time, and I apologize for all the questions we didn't get to answer. But like I said, we'll put up a resource page that Justin uh, will work on uh, answering a lot of the questions. Uh, we are very grateful to have you join us today and very appreciative of your support. Uh, this has been really fun for us and I really have enjoyed talking to Justin about orchids. It's something that I really want to learn more about myself. You dally in a little bit of everything when you're a professional, but some things you're better at than others. And I definitely need to get better in this uh, uh, class. But um, next week we will not have a Let's Talk Gardens. It's April Fool Day. So go out and fool someone with a beautiful plant instead. But we'll join you back again on April 8th for no another wonderful month of Let's Talk Gardens from Smithsonian Gardens. Thank you all for joining us. We'll see you again soon. Thank you, Justin. Thank, Thank you, you Sarah. Bye-bye. <laughs>